welcome to the Media Roundtable Industry Edition. If you've been keeping up with us, we've spent the last few years talking to leading voices and podcasts about what they create, why they create it, and the impact they want to have on the world. This is a true roundtable format, and like we say in the name, this is our Industry Edition. So it's going to be less focused on creators and more about how media and audio industry experts can adapt to the news of the day. Today, I'm your host, Stu Redwine, VP of Creative Services at Oxford Road, and I'm joined by my fellow agents of influence, Neil Lucy, EVP Strategy and Product at Oxford Road. How are you doing, Neil? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Good to have you. Spencer Siemenson, media buyer at Oxford Road. Glad to be here yet again. Always. And Kristen Duenes, associate media director at Oxford Road. 2023 and I'm back. Yeah, whole new year getting this party (laughs) started. Okay, Neil, Spencer, and Kristen, welcome to the Media Roundtable. Let's do this. Okay, so uh, lots of talk about different formats when always there's different formats. Uh, you know, what's going to win? Is it going to be VHS? Is it going to be Betamax? Is it, you know, what what's on top? Is video ultimately one day going to drive a cold uh, a dagger through the, the heart of audio? Um, Neil, why don't you talk to us about this first story with the wonderful title, Why Video Can't and Won't Replace Audio Podcasts? Sure, sure. Uh, We have a few stories that are video related, but uh, first up is this story from the podcast host, and it was written by Matthew McLean, and it's about how video won't replace audio. And, you know, first and foremost, uh, audio is a medium that goes with you. So that's a point that's made. So you can consume it while you're doing other things at work, going on a walk. Um, If video podcasts increase in production value, Actually, they'll start to steal money from TV industry. So, you know, that's a there's a, a point of actually expanding uh, where you can get your audience from and where you can get your dollars from. And then uh, another point that's made in the article is you know, certain genres, you know, especially drama and fiction, work so well, really, because there are in fact no visuals. Yeah, so, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so really interesting story. And I think uh, from my perspective, it's true. I mean, there there absolutely will always be a place for audio on only podcasts. Um, you know, we consume a while we're doing other things. But I think we just have to acknowledge that when given the choice, consumers will generally prefer video content over audio content. And, um, you know, we see that in terms of the popularity of YouTube as an out outlet for podcasts. Um, And then just from a podcast creator's perspective, if, if they're given the opportunity, I I think they would love to go after, you know, what could be $150 billion in projected TV and video dollars that's spent in the U S on a, on an annual basis versus the two, um, two plus billion that's spent in podcasts. Yeah, it's a lot bigger pie. And I know in doing the prep, Spencer, you had some uh, thoughts on this on this uh, story. Well, I mean, we're looking at video a lot at Oxford Road, and it makes a lot of sense because podcasts have always been the underdog versus legacy media. Now, YouTube, which has been growing quite a bit, has still been undervalued by legacy media. But as we've seen from the 2000s up to now, We've, they've always had to pivot to YouTube, whether it was the death of Vine or it was clips going viral. Um, this has always been the way to see large success. And if you talk to any management team for any talent on any medium, they will always say diversify. You know, if you're on TikTok, you need to be on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, you need to be on Instagram. You You need to have a large amount of media everywhere because the chance for reach is huge. And that is just always going to be the key for success. Now, that does not mean that YouTube or video is going to overtake podcasts. Um, Podcasts, they can go with you. 
They do not need to have your attention. They do not need to have a visual medium in order to work well. And you could say uh, that a lot of the reason why we're even seeing the advent of video uh, is because people who generally were doing tasks where their attention could be uh, on this one uh, audio format you can listen to audio while you do other things. There's a whole generation of young professionals who are older Gen Z and younger millennials who are now at home so they don't have a commute. They're able to keep their distractions uh, at home where nobody else can see them. And that is one of the reasons why YouTube is growing as a format and why most of our podcasts are going to the video format. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, you think about uh, the function of audio and what I wonder about, a couple quick reactions and we'll move on to the next story for me are driverless cars, right? Like driverless cars, it's going to, that's game changer. Uh, and I know, you know, that's in the works and a long time coming, but still it's like, okay, we have audio when we can't see visual. Um I was looking around and we all know this, but, and there's plenty, the world is replete with studies that confirm it, that visual vision is our dominant sense. Uh, and so if, and when we can, we want to use our eyes. Um, and, and so it makes sense uh, that, that we, we, we shift that also from the story. Like I'm way late to the party on podcasting. Apparently uh, the podcasts were alive from like 2008 or 2009, like one of the first fiction podcasts I'm like on episode 12 or something like every time I've walked my dog since I read that article on Friday really? or whatever it was. Yes. I I'm saw like, it oh. and I was like, I've never heard of that. And I was so surprised that a fiction podcast had started that early. Oh, and it's like a time capsule. It's cool. Like I recommend it because it's like, oh, like the smartphone. It's 2008. Like when the story happens. So there's just all these little things that they're doing anyway. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh audio descriptions of visual media and there was a recent 20,000 hertz episode about this where Dallas Taylor was unpacking like oh this is interesting like if you're streaming something game of thrones or whatever there's a audio description track which is interesting to listen to well now okay we're all liking fiction podcasts and listening to stuff this way i can turn on game of thrones seamlessly transition from the living room to go work in the yard and just keep listening to it because of those audio description tracks like so that's another way it can cut so so who knows how we'll see this all play out we do know we know people want to use their eyes and then also the next story as it's showing uh neil will take us through is that podcasting uh video helps and doesn't hurt podcasts it's not so much about video replacing podcasts it's about how it's helping podcast yeah, for sure. So the next story is, um, it's actually uh, came from the Morning Consult, and it shows um, really that the most active podcast listeners have a slight preference for video to audio only podcasts, so 46% to 42%. Um, we see that also in MRI data where uh, YouTube can kind of be slightly ahead of Spotify in terms of a, a place to listen to podcasts or consume podcasts. Um, what stood out for me more was one third of listeners are preferring YouTube as a podcast platform uh, compared to Spotify. So a slight preference at, versus Spotify. So Spotify is 24% or Apple that's at 12%. And then of course, um, you know, when, when, people start to consume media, uh, media companies take notice. So an example in this, uh, in this report from Morning Consult was 25 of ESPN's podcasts will include a video component. So, you know, from my perspective, uh, the reach of YouTube is just massive. It's, it reaches almost 70% of U.S. consumers. I think it's the number two most popular website worldwide. And when you consider the reach of YouTube, it actually, you know, if I trust the MRI data that I pulled, it has the reach of all digital audio services combined. And then not even to mention 
you know, paid cable television right now um, is reaching slightly less than 50% of U.S. households. So, you know, uh, YouTube has really, you know, in some regards replaced cable as a way to generate mass reach through video. So, you know, video to me represents a massive opportunity to increase the reach of podcasts. I think it's a, a way to grow audiences. There, there's a lot that um, it, it holds for us as marketers. It, it really does. And one of the things that, you know, that you mentioned to your point, it's like ESPN has got 25 shows now that are to some extent simulcast. And we're seeing that more and more with a lot of our network partners where they're either pushing their podcasts who aren't already simulcasting to do this, but also they're finding that they're losing downloads and impressions in favor of YouTube. So there's a lot of, of people who are downloading the audio off the podcast, reloading it into YouTube. They're the ones getting those impressions and they're the ones who are able to monetize. And instead like the network isn't because they're not the ones doing it. I was in Dallas this last August for podcast movement and more than one network. And I had a conversation about the prevalence of YouTube, how these players are doing this and how they're, they're pushing to get more of their audio features into YouTube. Even if it's just a title card with the audio, right? There's no actual video component. It's just the title card and then the audio playing because they want to be able to account for those impressions and not lose those and additionally monetize And then anecdotally, even further, this is really weird. I get to Dallas, I get into my, my Lyft car and the driver asks, Oh, what are you here for? And I said, Oh, podcast movement is, Oh, podcast. I love podcasts. I'm like, Oh, what, how are you listening to podcasts out of curiosity? You know, is it Spotify? Is it Pandora? Is it, you know, Apple? He tells me it's YouTube. So this guy (laughs) was already listening to his podcast on YouTube. And I'm, I will admit my evidence here. I had no idea that he, that people were doing this. I'm going, Oh, wow. Right. And, and so our whole thing in the last several years and, and always with Oxford road has been bring back the baked in reads, right? Give me the stuff that's in the content the lives that are like more part of the show and not just dynamically inserted because for our advertisers, having that there means we weren't losing those impressions. Um, whereas, you know, we, we could t- potentially be losing them if people are taking that audio and reposting it onto YouTube, but just having the seen this and having heard this, you know, coming up more and more really proves the point that, you know, this is where we need to be. YouTube is where, the podcasters need to be in order to not lose those listeners. I have a question. Yes. Kristen, I have a question for you. Okay. So bringing it down in the streets, um, somebody's buying a schedule. They're, they're buying a show and the way that the consumer, let's say it's me. Uh, let's say I'm the consumer. I listen mm-hmm. to Dan Carlin's hardcore history and I hear an ad on Spotify on my phone. That's how I consume them. If that's also available on YouTube, are you saying there's video of him and that's a separate feed with separate inventory? Like, how does Not that work? Not necessarily. I think it would depend on how it's being broadcast. If it if it's the show itself that is simulcasting on YouTube, then there is the potential for different ads to be placed in what could be considered a dynamic inserted spot. Um, if it's baked in, it would be a part of potentially part of the content, right? Kind of depending on how each show handles their their ad inventory. If you were listening on YouTube to that same show and it wasn't the network posting it and it wasn't the podcaster posting it and it was some random third party, then it could be whatever was in that audio feed that he downloaded, which would not necessarily include your ad. Wow, so it's kind of nuanced and confusing and someone would need an expert like you to help them navigate it. You're, it's almost like they would need me. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Spencer. Yes. And also a lot of times uh, for a reach play, you can, you don't really need to know that distinction, right? You're getting the ad on both places easily, but if you wanted to find performance and you know, you'd worked with us uh, previously and thought that the only way was a pixel. There are uh, ways to have separate vanity URLs and promo codes in order to track each individually. We have 
you know, tools at our disposal that showcases measurement as well. So if you really want to go the whole nine yards and check it for every possible distinction of perfection, we have those at our disposal as well. Yeah. I mean, look, if I was a client of Oxford Road, I'd want best in market performance at maximum viable scale. And so if that's the way that I get it, sign me up, Spencer. I want all of those things. Okay. So there's a sign in the wild, Neil, that this is where um, the the behemoth of Google is heading. Um, what What's that, that next story kind of rounding out this topic uh, have to tell us? Yeah. So this one came from... Uh... Uh, pod news. So uh, something I just came across uh, last week. So really just somewhat drives this home to a degree, but um, Google had has removed the ability to autoplay podcasts directly via the search engine. So if you're in the search results, you could just automatically play the, the podcast that you wanted to listen to. So they have positioned this, I believe, as an intended development, I think even potentially an improvement in consumer experience um, So, or a, a consumer experience. So, you know, a, a positive overall. Um, I don't know. I might be a little bit cynical here, but uh, somehow I, I'm not sure that consumers are the true beneficiaries of this change. I mean, if I want to listen to a podcast, I search it and play it. I think that's pretty pretty easy and in, in, in my best interest. Um, maybe, just maybe Google would prefer consumers to get their podcast content on YouTube and making a play for the additional ad dollars that they can monetize via the views of the, the ads during the podcast they're running on YouTube. So it's my my perspective, uh, but I think it's just interesting kind of how how the space is continuing to develop and we'll see where we see, we we'll see where it goes over time. So I think what would be interesting to see is, you know, with Google removing autoplay, if they're going to adjust the SEO to where then YouTube podcast listings come up first, because right now when you search most podcasts, you see Apple being at the top, right? So I search critical role. I see Apple being one of the top ones where I can go in and play the latest episode. So I click on that. I go to the show link and I can play it directly from, from Apple's link on whatever browser it is I'm using. And that's, that's wonderful and great. So then I've never seen podcasts come up for YouTube in the search engine when I'm searching via Google. So I think it's going to take some time for us to see how Google really addresses this. Are they going to then, you know, adjust it so that they're first at the, at which point then does Apple get mad because they've been paying for, for that to go up first in, in search engine queries. So it's going to be, I think a longer time period before we really see how this all plays out. All right. So tell me if you've ever heard of any of these companies. Indeed, Shopify, NetSuite, Headspace, Quip, Theragun, Postmates. You know, I'm not only the host of the Media Roundtable, but also CEO of a company called Oxford Road. And we are the world's leading independently owned and operated audio ad agency. And what that means is that we help great companies, many that you have probably heard of on some of the other podcasts that you listen to, we help them test and scale campaigns in audio channels with podcasts being one of those leading channels. Some of the work that we do includes media planning and buying, as well as analytics, attribution and insights. And we also have a very special way that we deal with uh, creative and copy generation. We have our own proprietary process called Audiolytics that allows us to score ads for their persuasiveness. If you're looking to be involved in audio and you want a partner that can help work with you to make sure that you achieve unprecedented ROI and massive scale, you should get in touch with us at Oxford Road. And by the way, the only reason that we're able to do the work of the Media Roundtable is because we have a great team at Oxford Road that supports us and makes it possible. 
So, you know, what we're doing is not just a podcast, but we're really trying to help brands live out their values and balance that with their business objectives, which is an increasingly hard thing to do in this world of misinformation and malice that's infecting so much of our media. But at Oxford Road, we don't want to just broker this stuff. We want to impact the industry for good. We want to raise the bar on what gets created. And Oxford Road is helping make that possible through the Media Roundtable. So if you're somebody that's interested in working with an ad agency or a partner on this type of work for your advertising campaigns, go to OxfordRoad.com. It's easy to spell. And get in touch with us or at least just sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer. That's OxfordRoad.com. I think like Neil, you had mentioned, I mean, it's one, one step at a time. I think Kristen, like you're saying, they're not going to do it all at once. And that the quote there from Google in the article, we're constantly experimenting with ways to improve the experience of, for our users is such a nice hedge. Cause it's like, <laughs> Oh, well we were doing that to, it, it's an experiment. That was just an experiment. So who knows what's in the mind of Google? I know we will find out, but I think we can all predict, uh, It's uh, podcast rules, everything around me, and it's going to be via YouTube. I think that's what I'm hearing from the group. Okay, so this next one, there's a lot of drama around this one, but there's something meaningful in the in the middle of it. And that's what we want to unpack, even though there's a whole bunch on the perimeter that could distract us. But Spencer has a sharp eye for what matters most to performance marketers in audio. Take it away, (laughs) Spencer. Yes, this uh, event was eloquently outlined in a recent article by Forbes, and it details the recent communication breakdown between Steven Crowder and the Daily Wire. In essence, Crowder is a large right-wing media personality who was in talks with the conservative giant to join their ranks. He did not find the details of the initial term sheet to be agreeable for a myriad of reasons, but the most damning was that he would not receive an agreed salary if he was demonetized or boycotted on YouTube. So the discourse around the industry is heightened, especially around the marketability of creator skill sets and personalities. And though many have highlighted the talking points Crowder has outlined, the main discourse at Oxford Road has been the role of YouTube in media personalities, monetization, and the visibility of ad partners in controversial discourse. And I'm going to throw it to Neil for his hot take on this topic. Yeah, I I think... Um... I mean, to me, this almost brings home kind of the the power of YouTube and the power of video overall, just from the the prior stories. I, I think w- what really caught my attention is if uh, Stephen Crowder is demonetized, he will straight away lose twenty five percent of his fee. So, uh, and and his fee is pretty large in terms of the overall contract. I think it was fifty million over four years. So it's a, a, a pretty yeah. sizable chunk of change, and that to me speaks to the fact that the, the media companies understand and are you know certainly monetizing YouTube and and taking advantage of those additional ad revenue dollars that can come through that platform. Yeah. And it's what's really interesting about it is that the way that we buy for podcasts is so completely different than YouTube. We've had a lot of issues around controversy and brand suitability since forever and have been working tirelessly to talk to our network partners about next steps if so-called controversy arises. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've checked Twitter one last time before I log on and logged off for the day to make sure nothing is going to screw up my next day. And uh, this is just like another part of the buying process. You have to talk to networks about what happens if this occurs, because demonetization means basically, one, that ad partners all leave. And the contract says that if 50% leave and they cannot replace in a 90 day window, that he would also lose part of his salary. But it also says that if he's demonetized, meaning that Google ads can't be served on the content, then he'd also lose salary. And when you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? Like, because if they can't recoup the money that they're putting into the production, um, then it, it makes sense that he would lose something in the deal. 
but it's not something that we've ever like seen. I've never seen a term sheet uh, leaked in this way before where they outright state like these are issues in the industry and this is the way that we're going to set this up because we have to make money, you have to make money, and this is a business. You can't just say whatever you want and just let it happen and let your ad partners deal with the brunt of those issues. And I think that's really interesting for like the future of direct marketing and for YouTube buying in the future. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And if, um, if there are only some way to, if there was a way to establish lane lines and, and parameters for what uh civil discourse looked like. Right. But I mean, if I'm... how, <laughs> what, I, you know, I would what, say that you you can pretty much say whatever you want to, but there are consequences. <laughs> so, and this exactly. is a, this is a very kind of straightforward consequence. Yes, say what you ever want, whatever you want to. You get demonetized. You lose your fee. Precisely. And how do you guys see you know at Oxford Road or or someone who's even trying to navigate this on their own? You know, how does how does an advertiser approach this to really think about it? critically and clear-headedly to go, you know, what, what really is at stake? And do I just need to avoid deals like this altogether? Um, what's the worst that can happen? What's the best that can happen? You know, how do you, cause so, sometimes somebody looks at this and it just goes, this, this channel is still the wild west. So forget it. And it's only the size it is. I'll wait till they iron this stuff out. Yeah. It's, it's interesting with that because Crowder was with a larger network um, and that's one of the reasons why he was speaking to the Daily Wire, because that contract was ending. And, you know, it's it's interesting because when you buy certain content with certain networks, they say, well, you know, this needs to be with somebody who doesn't care about uh, brand safety to the nth degree. You know, like they don't care about swear words. They don't care about like the fact that this might be trending on every social media site for two days straight. Um I don't think that all controversial figures are off the table for every advertiser, but I think you need to weigh the difference in controversy versus controversial figures, because one is always going to elicit controversy and the people who are buying your product might not actually have a problem with what is being said because they're the target demo. And the other is going to be offended by said controversy and want to boycott the sponsors. So it's always kind of like an even handed discourse where you're trying to figure out the difference between making the ads work, but not creating a like getting to a value based system for every advertiser. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking back on some of this stuff that um, Brian Barletta was talking about uh, when it comes to this stuff. And it was like, you know, you don't get to hour two and a half in a Joe Rogan program and hear the ad and go, he just said what? Exactly. You know, it's it's like Crowder's people are Crowder's people. So what are we really talking about uh, is at risk here? And I think also like kind of helping bring media roundtable down, um, down to earth in a sense of going like, you know, real world block and tackle. Um, I think Kristen, you could probably speak to this. Like, how do we help people plan for this? You know, how, what do we do the, when something like this happens? Like, what is it we have in place to help people make th these decisions? Um, you know, obviously we're, we're big on getting ahead of, of any sort of controversy, you know, we, we do work with barometer. So we are looking at how, you know, different shows are ranking amongst, you know, the, the different GARM components and where our clients threshold is in each of those. And so we're able to look at shows ahead of time and say, well, you know, if we're not, if you want to stay away from guns and ammo, then let's not go on these shows that have like NRA spokespeople. Right. So like, it's, fairly simple in advance to say, okay, here's, here's our, our threshold for pain. Here's where we're willing to be and, and kind of get ahead of it that way. On the flip side, you know, some people are are more in the middle and they're, they're capable of saying, okay, we know that our target audience is here. We know they're listening here. We still want to go after them and, you know, managing expectations saying, okay, well, these people, these podcasts, we know that most of the time, <laughs> <laughs> things are going to run a okay. Sometimes we're going to run into issues. And it's, you know, one thing that we've always preached is 
don't be reactionary. Um, people's memories can be very short. The media cycle is, is fast and it's going to move on to the next thing. So, you know, making sure that here, you know, that what you're getting yourself into, you're, you're not going to plan on, on everything being peaches and roses all the time. And if something does happen, make sure that, that you're okay, kind of like staying the course and, and getting through it and figuring, you know, over time, figuring out what the next piece is going to be and, and where you actually sit with it. So maybe we don't cancel everything right off the spot that, you know, maybe we kind of see what that new cycle does. And nine times out of 10, it ends up moving on pretty quickly. Our clients end up being happy. They didn't do anything right away. And in very, very rare cases, we say, okay, yeah, that's a hard line. Let's go ahead and, and see what we can do here. So it's just, I mean, long way of saying, let's manage everybody's expectations as best we can using the tools that we have at hand. Yeah, we don't want to react. We want to respond based on a set of parameters that we agreed to at the outset is what I'm hearing you say. And then, Neil, I know I kind of took, a, took it a little bit off the course of the article here, but as our head of product and everything, do you have um, any thoughts to kind of bring us home on this story? Uh, I, uh, Kristen covered it really pretty comprehensively. Um, I would just add, you know, sitting down with your agency, sitting down with us and going through a risk assessment at the outset to just understand your tolerance and then uh, utilizing the tools that are available. So there, I mean, it's, it isn't the wild west. There are tools out there like barometer and on, on the political spectrum, we subscribe to ad fontes. And so we have a, a pretty distinct idea of where podcasts are going to sit on the political spectrum and you can figure out your tolerance and where you will advertise and where you won't advertise. That's good. There's a way. There is a way to make our way through this no longer Wild West as um, according to Neil Lucy of podcasting. That's good. I can hang my six gun up. All right. <laughs> And on a new frontier, yet again, uh, as a Star Trek fan, I'm happy that uh, it. You know, they're so good at making the the predictions with the flip phone, with the tricorder, with touch screens, and the you know ever present computer. How far are we from that dying star? Um, this story, Pro KNX launches the first Chat GPT enabled smart speaker. So it's interesting because Pro KNX had a smart speaker that was like off uh, offline. So it wasn't connected for data security and protection. Um, they've now added in this functionality that you've got the capability to add in chat GPT so that you can talk uh, back and forth with the smart speaker. And I think, you know, from our little bit of um, as we're working with chat GPT on our creative stuff here, which we're leaning into heavy, you know, seeing chat GPT in a voice setting. I think what's interesting for all of us is that, you know, that kind of yet again, reframes our whole conversation where, you know, this thing is dynamic and it's moving. Um, is it video? Is it audio? Well, now it's audio you can talk to, uh, you know, how does that change things and how do you serve ads in that environment, uh, and capture people's attention? Um, what are your guys' thoughts on that? You know, walking in and 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 having this environment where we can just converse with the uh, with the smart speaker. So it's like really smart Alexa, basically. It's like yeah, I think that's exactly the way to say it. It is really smart Alexa. It's Alexa has gone to college and come back. So what? It, knows what? A thing or two. How is this like bringing up? Like, how is this, how are we leveling up with chat GPT? Are, are we asking like, what's the meaning of life? Are we asking more detailed questions? <laughs> what is going to be the long-term effect of this? Just so I understand. You can ask it for not... recipes. So you can ask okay. it for recipes. Without a whole set, story, like there is And online. to set timers. <laughs> and how is that going to change everything? <laughs> so what's funny about these, these, um, these models, these, these ever present AI models is that they're combing like trillions of bits of data in a very short period of time to come up with, with whatever it is you're querying. Right. 
and I saw something and it's, it's unrelated to audio, but I was on Reddit and I've got a mild addiction to, um, the, the, am I the asshole Reddit posts, right? As you should. And as I should, it's just mildly it's entertaining. It's appropriate it's time to program to let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I've noticed, and it's, it's easy for me to pick up and, and, but probably less so for others is you can tell when it's a chat bot that has come up with these stories. And so you can, you can tell an AI Here's the, what I want to have a story about. Write this for me so that I can calm, karma farm on Reddit. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating. It's a delightful story. It's well-rounded. It pulls all the major things from all the best, you know, highest rated Reddit posts. And so you, just using that as kind of like an analogy of what's happening, what can happen in audio is, is I think we're going to see a lot more AI created content, whether it be podcasts or commercials or, you know, what, what have you, and it's going to be, we set the parameters, but it's going to come up with the story. I think the drawback to those is going to be similar to what we saw with those AI um, illustrations where it was taking copyrighted material and repurposing it to create these AI illustrations. So if, if the, the model works similarly to what I think it's doing, it's, it's combing through all that data, but it's also using it. And so then you're going to run into a lot more issues down the road. And until that gets solved, I don't see this blowing up the way that they probably want it to, or even that we want it to, to an extent, because it's so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think you covered a lot there. I think um, on, on the copyright thing, I heard an interesting point of view that isn't that what I do at art school? <laughs> I go and look at all of Van Gogh's paintings and I think really hard about them. And then I go mm -hmm. paint my paintings. Did I not just do what I'm having that robot do? I just do it a lot slower. But the robot can do what I go to college to do, which is a look at a lot of other people's works and then generate my own work. So that's, you know, one little slice on that. But but to bring it back to the audio front, I think, you know, and kind of Spencer, like you're saying, so what? So what? I think it's just that with chat GPT getting plugged into um, smart speakers, it is like you're saying, and I, and I think that is the way to say it, is it's just a smarter version of Alexa where I can now converse. And then there's going to be an opportunity for primacy for ad units to go whatever the topic that that person's talking about, like in Google how then do we serve content into that conversation organically to go, oh, wow, this person's talking about the light coming through their thing or, or they're asking their chat GPT smart speaker about how do I do that home project, right? What do I need to do to sod my yard? That's what I'm doing, right? So what do I need to do to sod my yard? I go, duh, 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 duh. you know, Home Depot now, did they buy the opportunity to go, hey, while you're at that, you can do X, Y, Z, right? I mean, am I thinking about that right, Neil? I think so. I mean, I think you nailed it. Uh, and I I mean, I think uh, Spencer in the idea of a smarter Alexa is spot on as well. I mean, I think that wouldn't you love to have a smarter Alexa, um, you know, answering your queries? And then to your point, then having kind of contextually relevant advertising that goes along with it. So you know, it's, it's probably where things are going to go. And I think it's really interesting. But isn't Instagram kind of already doing that? Like I mean, the... we've all had it where you talk about something and your microphone's on and next thing you know, Insta's serving you an ad for the thing that you were talking about, or it shows up somewhere in your searches online. So it, it's, I, that's not, I don't know if that's necessarily new then because they're already listening to us and they're already mining. They us say they're not. They say they're they, not. They say they're I, I, not. I call BS. I call 100% BS because I've been talking to friends about something so obscure. And next thing I know, I'm getting served an ad for it. But has that friend then also searched it and you're connected to them? So it takes the cookies and figures out and then gets you the ad. Because that's what, that's what they're saying happens. I want to get them on this podcast. How do we get them? I, it's all sus. The, and the, get the robots on about. here. The robots. <laughs> I want to get on the robots. Well, guys, I think that sums it up. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining the Media Roundtable Industry Edition. This show is still dedicated to our mission of mobilizing marketers to advance truth and civility in journalism. 
We want you not just to know the news, but use it for good. If you're a marketer looking to balance business objectives with your brand values, reach out to our agency, Oxford Road, by visiting OxfordRoad.com and subscribing to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer. Thank you to our guests and to Bianca, Kyle, Haley, and the team at Podcast One. As always, influence responsibly.